And welcome once again to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer for Montgomery County Governor, Government. And uh, joining us today is Dr. Travis Gales, who is our health officer, as well as Dr. Earl Stoddard, who is the Acting Assistant Chief Administrative Officer. Members of the media, if you do not have permission to record yet, please use the chat to request it. And during the portion of Q&A, do ask permission to ask your questions, utilizing the chat and identifying the organization that you represent. And with that, I toss it to you, Mr. County Executive. Okay, so thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us again for our weekly press briefing. Um, so before we begin on the, uh, the normal state of affairs, I just want to congratulate Montgomery County's Kitty Ledecky on her gold medal winning swim last night, as well as winning a silver over the weekend. Uh, Katie has established herself as one of the best, best athletes ever from Montgomery County. And most importantly, she's a great role model and always generous with her time for her fans and for our community. And we're here cheering her on and hope that other Montgomery County athletes com competing in this year's Olymp Olympics do well as, um, as well. Uh, so meanwhile, back in the COVID world, um, this week we continue to see increases in the spread of the Delta variant in Montgomery County. We find our positivity rate to be 1.7% and case rate per 100,000 is 477 per 100,000. We had 57 new cases and our hospitalization rate remains low, but we had five new hospitalizations yesterday and sadly one new death. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in our testing and that's a sign that our residents are concerned. I wanna emphasize that when we say it's 4.77 cases per 100,000, um, it somewhat is somewhat dilutes the impact because this is really occurring in the largely unvaccinated population of Montgomery County. And so you get a sense that this is more intensely going through that community. This is not a surprise. Um, unvaccinated folks around this country are getting um, sick and they are dying and this is this is not a good outcome. This is something that could be avoided. There is no reason for the illness and death that's occurring in this country. No reason for the level of cases that are occurring in Montgomery County, but for the people who refuse to get vaccinated. Uh, we know the children under 12 can't, but it's that older population which, um, if they get sick, they are very likely to be in positions to transmit it, not just to other people who are adults, but also to children. And as we try to reopen our schools this year, and as we're trying to maintain everything we have in its current open state, um, folks who don't want to get vaccinated are really jeopardizing this. They are making it more likely that other people will get sick and will wind up in hospitals. And we worked really hard to get ourselves into a good place and Relatively speaking, we're in a good place, but these numbers are not good numbers. 57 new cases uh, is multiples of where we were just a few short weeks ago before the Delta um, expanded like wildfire in this county as it's doing throughout the rest of the country. So we continue to be very concerned about this. Uh, currently 70.5% of our residents have received both doses of Pfizer and Moderna or a single dose of J&J &J according to CDC data. And we continue to lead the nation at 83% of our eligible population um, being vaccinated. 91.2 of our eligible population has had a, at least one dose. So these are really significant numbers. Um, significant numbers, but still Delta's out there and for the people who aren't vaccinated, it is going through that part of the population. Um, it's important to note that 77% of our new confirmed COVID cases are in unvaccinated individuals. 23% uh, of this number is for people between the ages of zero and 19. And 77% are in people who are 20 and older. And from our data, 20 to 40 year old unvaccinated adults are driving our new cases. Um, the unvaccinated are at great risk and they are putting others at risk. There's no better way or nicer way to say it. 
Um, I encourage everyone who's unvaccinated to get vaccinated and please don't wait until you get sick. It could be too late. I mean, I've watched far too many stories on the internet of people who are dying who didn't get vaccinated. And then as they lay there dying, talking about how they wish they had gotten vaccinated. Um, that's the wrong time to wish you made a dis different decision. This is the right time to make a different decision. Uh, MCPS and CDC guidelines on masking um, have both come out and I'm glad to see that MCPS decided to mandate masks in all county schools for students, faculty, staff, and visitors. At this point in time, this is the smartest decision to keep our kids and their families safe. Yesterday, the CDC updated its masking guidance and recommended to jurisdictions that are seeing substantial levels of transmission rates that masking should be required indoors, even for those who are vaccinated. Currently, our transmission rate is moderate. However, we have neighboring jurisdictions, such as the District of Columbia, City of Alexandria, who have reached the substantial level of transmissions. We expect there will be other neighboring jurisdictions that may reach substantial level of transmission as well. And experts are predicting that we are a few weeks behind our European counterparts and that we can see these rates growing worse before they plateau and decline. As one of the nation's most vaccinated jurisdictions, Montgomery County is as protected against the variant as can be, but we can and we must do better. Dr. Gales and Dr. Starter will address what metrics they are going to watch carefully and potential tactics that we can take. Uh, since the council is ongoing in their summer recess, they would have to convene as a board of health if any current restrictions or mandates um, need to be changed. So be aware of that. Um, we're trying to avoid doing the drastic things we had to do before. Um, the residents of this county have done a great job in getting vaccinated. Uh, we need everybody, frankly, to join this. And hopefully those of you who've been vaccinated will encourage those who haven't to get vaccinated so they don't jeopardize everything we've done to try to bring things back to normal. Um, as far as rent relief goes, we're nearing $11 million in approved aid and we've released that's um, that's been approved and released in the latest phase three round. This represents about um, almost 1,100 households and we've put another 2,100 active applications in the process. This puts us at 42% of meeting the treasury spending deadline, uh, wherein 65% has to be applicated by September 30th. We're now on track to release more than $2 million each week and that is progress moving forward. One thing we've been able to do is working with the Sheriff's Department, we are getting the weekly data on who is getting evicted. And we are focusing on these eviction lists because while there are lots of people who are behind in rent, the people who are immediately vulnerable are the folks who've gone through the court proceedings and are facing eviction. We are scrubbing that list and we're comparing it to the people we know who have submitted applications. We are gonna accelerate attention to the applications that have been submitted. When we find people on these lists who have not submitted an application, we are notifying them of our process and we're also contacting landlords um, to reassure them that if people get their applications in, we will be able to stand up uh, support for many of these tenants. So we've decided to try to focus on this rather than just simply um, focusing on going through the, the pile of applications that we have because we don't want to miss people who are in immediate danger of being evicted. So we've kind of hybridized our approach to this. We get through the people we know have evictions. We also focus on the rest of the people who are waiting. But we don't, again, we don't know that eviction um, list until the beginning of each week. In total, we've allocated $28.8 million in rental reef, rent relief assistance that's been provided since May 2020, and that's supported almost uh, 5,600 households. And it's been helpful to our operations. We're now getting the eviction lists, like I said. Next week, we're going to hold a media event highlighting us reaching $30 million in rental relief that will provide us an opportunity to promote and get the word out that these funds are available. And I believe there are a lot more people who are in need, we know that, and not applying, and we must continue to reach out to them. And not applying is a problem, but a bigger problem is not showing up for your court date. We urge you, if you have gotten an eviction notice, 
you need to go to court. There is no automatic um, extension of non-eviction actions. That's why the eviction court is in business again. Uh, you cannot rely on any protection that you imagine out there is going to keep you from getting evicted. You need to show up. And if you show up and you've been evicted because you lost a job due to COVID, um, there's a good chance you can get relief. But if you don't show up, there is zero chance that you will get relief and you're perhaps subjecting yourself to an eviction that you otherwise might not have to suffer. So if you're out there listening and thinking about this, please make sure um, that you've applied for aid if you're behind and if you've got an eviction notice, be sure you show up in court. I wanna announce, you know, almost a year ago, Dr. Gales issued a series of health officer directives that temporarily closing, um, temporarily closed private schools as part of efforts to stem the transmission of COVID-19. At that time, the public schools were, were still closed. A small group of parents filed a lawsuit against Dr. Gales, the county executive, and the county alleging that Dr. Gales did not have authority to issue the directives and challenging the constitutionality of these orders. Yesterday, a federal court dismissed the lawsuit and found the claims challenging Dr. Gale's authority were moot because the directives were rescinded and the plaintiff's constitutional claims failed because the directives were content neutral. They applied to all private schools, not just religious private schools. There was a rational basis for the directives, the curbing of COVID-19 infection rates in schools that were still open and because they were narrowly tailored, the temporary limited closure of private schools. I'm thankful for the efforts of our county leaders for defending this case, and I want to especially uh, give my appreciation to the entire COVID-19 response team, especially Dr. Gales and Dr. Stoddard, Dr. Bridgers, for their efforts and recommendations that always prioritize the health of our residents. Um, it is pretty clear to see that the decisions we made have made Montgomery County one of the safest places in the country, and we would be a lot safer if everybody would get their vaccinations. That is what stands between us and being able to handle the Delta variant in a less dramatic and possibly less impactful way. Um, yesterday, the police department reduced, released the video of the shooting of Ryan LaRue. Um, we continue to investigate this incident um, we know the community is going to view this footage and they're going to have questions. I have questions. I'm still trying to understand how an incident that began as calmly as that one did turned so violent so suddenly. And we're going to be looking at what our tactical approaches were, uh, what could have been done to minimize the creation of situations where officers uh, have to make split second life and death decisions. Um, that is a recurring theme in a number of the shootings that have occurred in Montgomery County where things came down to very much split second decisions. And uh, we need to figure out ways, um, hopefully, to minimize putting people in the situation where they have to make that kind of decision. So we're gonna review this outcome. We are gonna engage the um, effective law enforcement for all group that's been working with the county um, on our general reform of policing. We're gonna engage them as an act to do an after action review of this and other lethal use of force incidents in the county, look for common themes and changes that we might be able to make in our approaches that would have either prevented, that, prevented or even further minimized the likelihood that something like this would happen. Um, they will provide additional recommendations for policy and we will implement those recommendations. Um, this is not going to be a separate in investigation into this incident, but it's going to be a set of case studies that focus on how we respond. And I want to continue to, you know, share my condolences and sympathies with the LaRue family and his friends. And I want to ensure our community will continue to engage and communicate transparently about this incident throughout the legal process as it moves forward. I do want to add that um, the time to release the video was dictated by the um, request of the Howard County State's Attorney, which handles um, shootings, police officer involved shootings in Montgomery County, um, that wanted to make sure that video was not available for viewing until all of the witnesses 
had made their statements. Um, they wanted not to have any opportunity for a video to alter people's perceptions of what they had seen. We wanted, they wanted the testimony uh, to be based strictly on what people had seen in the moment they were in. And I will stop there and turn this over to, I guess, Dr. Yells. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Wednesday. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you all. Uh, I don't have much to uh, extend beyond the county executive's remarks. Uh, he's highlighted where we stand in terms of our community transmission, our concerns over the trends in terms of data moving forward with the impact of the Delta variant, and how we will continue to monitor those trends in terms of numbers of new cases, as well as if there's a correlation to uh, the number of folks requiring hospitalization and utilizing healthcare due to the severity of their symptoms. So to his earlier point about metrics that we're looking to think through and looking to examine in terms of the potential for next steps. We are, uh, as we've done throughout the pandemic, continue to look at those measures of community transmission, including our positivity rate, uh, which we are uh, seeing an increase in the number of folks getting tested, uh, as well as our case rate, our hospitalization rate. And we have a new factor now that we didn't have last year, which is uh, the percentage of our, of our, our residents vaccinated. So when we talk about uh, there being some breakthrough cases, I just want to emphasize is that in, it's all about the denominator. We have over 800,000 folks who've received at least one dose in the county. And of that, for example, in the last month, we have seen, I want to say approximately 140 cases, breakthrough cases being people who've been fully vaccinated. So 140 divided by 800,000 is roughly 0.0001%. So small percentage of folks, but it can happen. The burden and impact of the Delta variant is most, most uh, impactful in those, those folks who are unvaccinated. Uh, we're seeing across the country an uptick in cases across the board, particularly in that group. That group remains the, the overwhelming majority, if not all of the hospitalizations across the state, as well as COVID-related fatalities. So we continue to encourage folks to get vaccinated so that we can drive down community transmission and move on to a post-COVID world. And as always, because it's summertime, continue to encourage folks to make sure they stay hydrated during the, the, the extreme temperatures and continue to check on your relatives, your friends, and your neighbors to make sure that they are safe during these uh, higher elevated temperature times. Uh, in terms of things, the last thing I would mention the county executive referenced different ideas that could potentially be put into place to mitigate transmission. Certainly, we are we in the health uh, side of things want to push forward and make sure that activities are able able to open up as fully uh, as they can and return to a sense of normalcy. We also want to make sure that we provide guidance to make sure that they can be done so safely. So there are a host of different tools in the toolkit, ranging from potentially re-implementing the face covering uh, requirement, particularly in indoor settings, uh, to you know some of the more uh, significant measures if the numbers worsen even more, including potential capacity limits or re-implementation of physical distancing measures and those types of things. We encourage folks, as we discussed in the council briefing on yesterday, to be mindful of where you're traveling. Do your research in terms of knowing what the community transmission levels are of the places that you're going. Continue to follow those uh, public health guidelines around face coverings, physical distancing, and minimizing exposure to folks outside of your household to diminish your risk of contracting COVID. We also certainly encourage folks when they return home, uh, even if it's the domestic uh, destination, particularly given uh, where, where you're going in the community transmission levels, we also encourage you to get tested so you know your status before reintroducing yourself back to your schools, your workplace, and those types of things. I will stop there. Happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gales, and thank you, Mr. County Executive. I know Dr. Stoddard is not having any remarks, and we do have a hard stop at 1 o'clock this afternoon. First question comes from Dominique Maria Bonesi from WAMU. And uh, two questions directed to you, Dr. Gales, and also to Dr. Stotters. Dominique. 
it might not be two, it might just be one, but we'll see. Um, so my question uh, to the doctors is, um, I'm, I'm looking to know right now, I think people see, you know, the, the moderate level of transmission um, according to the CDC's database, um, but we are seeing substantial transmission in DC and uh, Alexandria, as the county executive said. Um, you know, obviously, if we get to that substantial level, there's going to be some recommendation to wear a mask. But as of right now, do you think people should be taking precautions, you know, people who might be concerned about transmitting the virus to others, potentially, should we be wearing masks in grocery stores, inside restaurants? I mean, are, are these things that people should consider who might need to, you know, I, I refer to it as a dial, you know, dial up or down, you know, COVID restrictions, what have you? Hi, Dominic. Thank you for your question. Uh, yeah, so the short answer is yes. Uh, you know, I, I've, I think the approach we've taken in the county throughout the pandemic is to not necessarily wait for numbers to reach those thresholds that we consider to be bad or, or alarming, particularly if the trends are moving in that direction. Uh, so for any, we've, we've always supported the idea that, you know, unvaccinated people should be wearing face coverings when they're around others in public. Uh, and we, that has not changed. And I think we continue to support and recommend to folks that if there are concerns, particularly, particularly in indoor settings, um, given the, the, the trends and numbers, that it would be a very good idea uh, to have on a face covering when interacting with others or coming into contact with others outside of your household. And then just one more question about travel, actually. Um, is there any consideration, I don't know if this would have to go through the council, but on a travel advisory to states that have substantial or higher um, transmission rates? Uh, yet another great question. Uh, I would include that as, as part of the, the many tools that we would potentially have in our toolkit to help mitigate and drive down community transmission. Uh, in the interim, again, we strongly encourage folks who are traveling, uh, whether it's domestically or, or internationally, to do your homework in terms of looking at what the community transmission levels are. Interestingly, right now, we have some domestic locations and destinations that have higher rates than, than places uh, in, in other countries, uh, including the state of Florida. So we want to make sure that in the, in the absence of a travel advisory or, 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 you know, in the time that it takes to put, put together one, that, that folks, you know, continue to be mindful of the numbers uh, and the transmission levels in the places that they're, they're going. Can I, can I just add, I think I speak for both the county executive, Dr. Gales, and I'll even say the county council, no one wants to have to implement additional restrictions of any kind. Um, we're not interested in doing it. We're hoping that, you know, the cases come, you know, flatten out and start to come back down without us having to implement some of the, the restrictions that Dr. Gales referred to. But at the same time, you know, we're thinking about, you know, the students coming back to the schools at the end of August, early September, we need to have an environment that supports their being able to be successful in that environment, being able to continue to have people work and live without having to implement restrictions. And so we don't want to wait till things are really bad. Then we have to put in more draconian measures very quickly. Uh, we're trying to get people to get vaccinated, you know, you can be more cautious, get tested, and maybe we can avoid having to do all of those things. We hope we can avoid having to do all those more restrictive measures. We're not interested in doing them, but, we, I think we've shown in Montgomery County that we're, we're going to be prudent and we're willing to take the hard, uh, make the hard recommendation and the council and the county executive have been willing to make, take the hard action to, to limit the spread of COVID-19 and you know, prevent uh, loss of life and, and hospitalizations and sickness. Thank you, uh, Dominique. The next question, set of questions comes from Steve Bonnell, but that's to be Steve. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of the things that's obviously different, uh, and this is for anybody really, but probably into the health officers first, um, this go around is that we do have a lot of people that are vaccinated. So as you're thinking, you know, worst case scenario, some of these restrictions have to be put back into place. Is there any way of your, that you're going to be able to craft it so that, you know, if you're able to prove that you're vaccinated, some of these restrictions won't apply to you? Um, a lot of people were talking at the beginning as these vaccines were getting going, you know, a vaccine passport or whatever. I mean, how is that kind of factoring into, again, worst case scenario, these cases continue to go up, uh, how you might craft any 
restrictions? Thank you, Steve, for your question. Well, certainly the, the level of, of folks who are vaccinated in the community, um, you know, helps us have perspective in terms of when we're seeing an uptick in cases, it kind of gives us some insights in terms of those who are most vulnerable and most at risk of having a severely complicated course of COVID um, should they contract it, meaning they'd end up in the hospital, um, have a protracted course, and in some cases, unfortunately, pass away. So uh, in the absence of a vaccine passport, we do look at that that percentage um, and hopefully that percentage of our residents continues to increase in terms of those who are vaccinated. Now in terms of creating a vaccine passport and so forth, let's be clear, businesses even now in the absence of a countywide or a statewide provision have the ability to restrict access to their services and to their venues based upon uh, vaccine status and are able to enforce that. Now it's tricky because there's no uh, formal platform at the federal level or state level that uh, creates a space to do that uh, absent of you know being able to demonstrate and show your vaccine card or some other type of documentation uh, that shows that you've been fully vaccinated. I would liken what you've, you've mentioned as again another potential uh, tool in the toolkit uh, as we move forward in terms of being able to uh, you know, think about different restrictions or different uh, requirements to, to keep folks safe. So I would say that, you know, from a health perspective, we're looking at a whole host of different options because at the end of the day, obviously, we want things to move forward, to move forward in terms of capacity staying the same. As Dr. Stoddard mentioned, we want to get kids back to school. We want businesses to stay open and reopen. Uh, but again, want to make sure that there are some parameters in place to make sure that they can be done safely. I'm guessing it would be easier to implement that within county buildings than, like you said, the private sector from a legal perspective. Does that make sense? I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I would imagine <laughs> that there are some, you know, there are different places where some of these restrictions may be able to be enforced uh, in a different way. But certainly we do recognize that. Um, you know, with these different suggestions and recommendations, there are, you know, unintended consequences. So for example, requiring face coverings would, you have to make sure that you've got staff and security and those kinds of things in place to be able to, uh, you know, to follow up and, and make sure you've got a common entry point to, to, to make sure that everybody is, is abiding by the rules. Yeah, I would just say, Steve, obviously, not only are we thinking about countywide, but obviously Montgomery County is an employer, Montgomery County is a service provider. You know, so we're looking at it from all perspectives, and obviously we're we're keen to the challenges posed by, for example, uh, demonstration of vaccine status at, as you enter a facility. You know, Montgomery County buildings, uh, you know, where, where we provide services are designed to be open, meaning multiple entry points, multiple points of exit. They're not many. They're not many bottlenecks where we push people through a single exit with a security guard who could e easily screen vaccine cards, for example, and so. Um, that's not to say that we're not, we're thinking through all these things, and that's part of this contingency plan the county executive has asked us to do, is to understand not just what makes sense, but also what can be implemented successfully and enforced if if ultimately we go down those roads. And so uh, we're trying to think a little bit differently than we have in the past, given the given the availability of the vaccine as we consider some of these, um, you know, some, some of these measures. And uh, to the extent that we can, we obviously want to focus our efforts on those people, as Dr. Dale said, who are at most risk, which right now, candidly, are the people who are unvaccinated. This last one uh, is for the county executive on a different topic. Uh, the shooting of Ryan LaRue, I think, was brought up yesterday about an after action review of yes. this incident. Can you go into how <laughs> that might differ from other audits and other similar incidents, how that might unfold? Well, you know, we've We've been using um, ELE 4A to analyze um, our department. We've been looking at training. We've been looking at tactical approaches to things. Um, we're asking them to specifically look at this, sh this shooting. Also, the other um, shootings that have occurred, that almost all of the others involve mental health issues, and uh, to look for you know common threads and what you would do differently. I mean, the most painful thing about watching anything is as you watch something, you're this the what if notion. What if this had happened? What if that had happened? And maybe some what ifs are so 
hypothetical and likely that it's not realistic, but there may well be what ifs that are totally realistic. And, you know, I want to make sure that when we look at this, um, we're evaluating very closely, you know, how officers get in a situation where they have to make that life and death decision. You know, at what point do you feel that you're in jeopardy and that this is the only way out of being in jeopardy? And are there things we could do differently um, that might have either bought more time or, you know, allowed for a different resolution? And so these, this group is very experienced. They have expertise from, you know, a multitude of different places in the country. And we'd like them to look at this and just say, what do you say and what would you recommend? If I may add, so Montgomery County Police has a use of force committee that they review these incidents from an internal perspective after everyone's, after the investigations, both the administrative investigation as well as the criminal investigation are concluded. They look at them from a policy perspective. The thought process is, you know, obviously as the county executive has said, ELE, ELE4A has expertise from across the country that they can bring into that, you know, to that process and provide a more robust review of not just, you know, where policies followed, but also, do we have, are, the, do, are there more policies that we need to have or more procedures that we need to have both, you know, before, during, and after the incident with regard to, you know, the release of information, the, the communication platform. So they're really going to do a pre-incident through post-incident analysis with us as a partner to try and try and understand exactly how, how we can avoid these situations in the future as the county executive says. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next set of questions from Kate Ryan, WTOP. Hey, Dr. Gales, I know you've touched on this several times, but I want to make sure I'm absolutely clear because it did come up during the um, uh, Board of Education uh, discussion yesterday from parents. Precisely what metrics will you be looking at and how soon would you know what metrics you'll look at for having to go beyond, say, uh, indoor masking or uh, capacity reductions? Do you know when you might have a better idea of when that might happen? What are you looking at? Uh, so, Kate, thank you for your question. Consistent with what we've looked at throughout the pandemic, throughout the last year, we look at a host of measures for community transmission, including case rate, test positivity, hospitalization rate, as well as now we'll continue to look at the percentage of our residents who are vaccinated. Um, and also that will help us give a better understanding again of the potential impact of the, the variants, particularly um, as we, you know, if we notice any significant changes in terms of the number of new cases correlating with an increase in folks showing up into our hospitals again and requiring ICU type critical care and those types of things. Got it. Thank you. And then in terms of uh, the school board said they'd had 26,000 students in for their summer sessions and they had just 13 cases of COVID. Should parents feel a little bit better about heading back to, you know, full-time classes in the fall, especially with the mask mandate now, if they were nervous before? Because I know we're still waiting for uh, vaccine eligibility for those under 12. Sure, I think that's that's a great point. Um, and you know, children are 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 their parents' most important things, and so it's natural for them to be concerned about their their safety and their their health and wellness, particularly given that they remain un ineligible to to receive the vaccine. And hopefully, that will move. We'll get some indications hopefully soon in the next weeks that you know are are definite. More information in terms of when that that may happen. In the meantime, so yes, the the fact that we did not see a lot of outbreaks uh, during the summer school session, uh, hopefully, will give parents confidence that the school system has in place not only face coverings but also a host of other measures to ensure that students are staying safe within that that space. Um, and um, you know, th that underscores why we have to take those extra steps to make sure that that population who is vulnerable because they are not eligible to get the vaccine um, are protected. And the other thing that I would also include into that is there's another group that we have not typically talked about as much 
in, in terms of those being vulnerable for, uh, you know, for continued COVID, um, even for those who've been, been vaccinated, you know, individuals with underlying medical conditions. Uh, you know, it's important to make sure, again, that we drive community transmission down as much as possible to reduce the risk of those individuals coming into contact with COVID. Uh, as the county executive mentioned in his earlier remarks, uh, folks with underlying conditions, we know historically throughout the pandemic, have disproportionately uh, uh, been impacted by COVID in terms of hospitalizations and complications. And again, while the vaccine does offer protection and keeps people out of the hospital and keeps them from developing complications, we again want to do everything we can to make sure that we continue to have procedures and policies in place to protect those with those underlying medical conditions, um, including those who may have some issues with uh, immune systems that uh, make their response to the vaccine a little bit different. And Thank Kate, you. I actually, you know, I'm, I'm uh, a parent of an eight and 11 year old who have been participating in MCPS's uh, in-person education opportunities over the summer. Uh, and I can say that I've been very pleased from my observation, both as a parent and as a Per person working in the in the COVID space that they're they're doing an exceptionally good job of of making a safe school environment and it gives me as a parent, as well as someone uh, who's you know obviously engaged in this response, uh, a great degree degree of confidence that they're going to be successful in the fall. Um, but, but but candidly, I think part of what we're talking about today is really trying to help them out with that process by making sure that we, we are, we're supporting a safe county environment for them to be successful in the school system with. Thank you. And then a non-COVID uh, item for the county executive. Uh, you released a statement on the 5G decision by the county council, and you talked about a work group that could be formed. But my question, and I you know, talked to you about this a little bit earlier, um, what good would that do now if I'm a resident who says, well, now we have, you're allowing these things within 30 feet of my house. What's a work group going to do for me? Um, it's hard to say what a work group will do. It depends on the council's interest in, you know, hearing what people have to say. Um, they obviously relied on, you know, old testimony and, you know, we did this in the middle of COVID, which is not, would not have been the moment I chose to do something that involved you know should have involved a lot of community input but that said you know we it would be useful for residents to understand at least what it is they're going to get and what it's going to look like and it may be that when because we were had been talking to some of their providers about giving us uh, a sense of what the actual distribution of towers would be in particular neighborhoods and people may get a sense that this is you know less intrusive than they have feared, or they might get a sense that this is really more than they were told. Um, but I think it would be useful for residents to get a handle on this. You know, in reality, in this world, things are never closed forever. And there's always the opportunity to revisit things if, you know, there's sufficient interest in the community to revisit it. Um, but, you know, our sense is people are still, you know, pretty confused about this, pretty confused about where they can go, um, what it means in particular neighborhoods, what it means where you don't have um, utility poles existing, which is probably the biggest concern of all. I mean, I have a 5G phone. I get 5G all over Montgomery County. Uh, it is not the case that there is no 5G in Montgomery County. That is ridiculous. But there is 5G. But there's not 5G in um, every place in Montgomery County. And the question is, you know, how how does it get there and how does it get there in a way that doesn't necessarily put it butt up against somebody's house. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Next question, Kevin Lewis, ABC7. Kevin. Hi there, thank you. So uh, Kate touched on the metrics that y'all are looking at. Um, you gave some nice specifics there. Specifically, what type of restrictions are we looking at that would be a first or second wave? I know face coverings come to mind for everyone, but clearly there uh, are more restrictions that we saw uh, in 2020 and just wanted to know uh, what we are potentially looking at uh, here in 2021. Thank you, Kevin, for your question. So consistent with what we've laid out in the briefing so far and our briefing with council yesterday, again, there's a host of different tools in the toolkit that could be potentially effective, again, dependent upon how the numbers and the trends go. Um, the first one, 
would be looking at. And again, let me preface this by saying this is not meant to say I'm laying out a ladder of how this will move forward. I don't want to get quoted and say we're going to do this first and that second and third. But here are different tools. Um, so you mentioned one, face coverings. Uh, you know, requiring folks to wear face coverings in indoor settings. You know, face coverings in indoor and outdoor settings. Um, you know, if if numbers, I would say that those are probably some of the things that in an early set of interventions could potentially decrease community transmission. So further actions such as, you know, capacity limit restrictions, such as what we, we did before in the past, um, you know, th that, that level of restrictions would have to take place. I think certainly, you know, as was discussed, uh, I think it was Kate's question or Dominique's question earlier, you know, about the potential of travel advisories to certain areas, those types of things. Again, I think it, the, the actions taken will be dependent upon, you know, looking at where we're seeing the biggest rise in cases and if there are any particular activities that are jumping out that are causing concern. Um, I think, you know, to borrow a, 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 com a comment that we talked about, I believe it was with an exchange with Councilmember Jawando yesterday, was taking a surgical knife or a scalpel approach to this to have the greatest impact first before, you know, having to go back and implement some of those broader changes and broader level of restrictions. And to emphasize what Dr. Stoddard mentioned, we don't, <laughs> we, we don't want to have to do any of this. We want to uh, continue to push forward and move forward and, and open things up. But again, make sure we do it as safely as possible. Okay, and to follow uh, on that, the difference between uh, the DC region right now <clears throat> in LA County, St. Louis City, St. Louis County that have imposed the mass mandates, um, is it just their numbers are higher than ours and, and there's more justification there at this time? Well, the, there are a couple things um, and a couple observations. I think one, the numbers are higher and you know, as evidenced by how uh, CDC broke things down yesterday saying, you know, putting folks into different categories. And those categories are uh, quantifying community transmission levels. And they're looking at case rates and test positivity in particular, which is again, consistent with, with their definition throughout the pandemic. One of the other things that is a game changer for us is that our vaccine numbers are much higher than some of those other places, particularly when you look at Missouri, you look at Florida, you look at Alabama, and some of those other places. And that's significant because we know the vaccines are working. And you know the higher percentage of folks that you have vaccinated, even in the setting of those breakthrough cases, as best as I know, not to say that it's 100%, but as best as I know, and as best as our surveillance information suggests, is that those who are turning up positive as breakthrough cases are not getting sick, they're not getting hospitalized, and they're not having those complications. On the flip side, you're concerned about where you have pockets, significant pockets of people who are unvaccinated because they are still at greater risk of developing those more severe courses of illness and unfortunately potentially having greater risk of being hospitalized and greater risk of, of having long-term consequences and unfortunately having uh, passing away due, due to COVID. And so that's what we also have to be mindful of in terms of the differences when we look at the numbers. Uh, we're sitting at a much different place than some of those others in terms of the percentage of our population vaccinated. I would just for context, um, I was just looking at the numbers while, while, while uh, Dr. Yells was answering that question. As of yesterday, there are 891 people in LA County who are hospitalized with COVID. Uh, we had five new hospitalizations today for some context. I realize LA County is much larger than we are, but they're not uh, that order of magnitude different. And as Dr. Gale said, that has, that, that's reflective of the fact that they have a substantially lower vaccination rate. Their vaccination rate is pretty good. It's much lower than ours, which is one of the best. And so obviously when we talk really about where we are, um, while our cases are going up and we are seeing a small but noticeable uptick in hospitalizations, we're just not to the point where LA County certainly is in terms of their overall uh, number of cases, but also, frankly, we're nowhere near their level of hospitalizations yet. And so that's why we, uh, not to say, to be clear, we're not gonna wait until things are bad and to do something. We, I, I think that's, that would, because number one, you have to be more aggressive than, and it takes longer to get you out of it. 
But at the same time, I think we have some opportunity to be prudent and analyze the numbers, as Dr. Gale said, and understand exactly how we align the conditions to say, what are we going, not only when are we going to do something, but what are we going to do next? Okay, the only other question I have, um, it's twofold. Have three of you or any of you uh, resumed mask wearing indoors because of the numbers that have uh, upticked? And is there a recommendation from the county right now for people who are vaccinated? Should they be going back to masking indoors when they walk into a restaurant or a bar? Uh, or do you feel we're not there again for vaccinated people? I'll, I could, I'll start, that's, I mean, I have young kids, so if I, if I, honestly, if I'm wearing a face covering most of the time now, it's to set a good example for them to keep it on, honestly, because if I'm not wearing mine, they'll be less inclined to wear theirs. Um, and most settings, I don't think there's very many settings where I've worn a face covering other than where I was required to by the business itself over the last month. Um, will that change in the immediate future? Um, I think it's likely to, and I think there's probably a few more places that I would wear a face covering than I would have two weeks ago. Um, I'll know that as I get up and I see how, you know, it's going to be based on how many people are inside there. And so it will not be every indoor environment that I'll wear a face covering right now until or unless I'm required to um, because I am vaccinated. But um, I try to be use my best judgment based on how long I'm going to be in a place, how many people I'm likely to interact with, what the distancing inside is like. And that's really what we're trying to ask people to do is if, they're, if they feel like they're in an environment that's a little less controlled, they don't know the vaccination status, they're going to be there for a long time. They should, they should exercise good judgment and, and begin to be a little more cautious. And I, I'm basically where, um, where Dr. Stoddard is. Um, I kind of judge it by how busy is the place I'm going into. I, I will say like in a restaurant, it seems to make very little difference whether you wear a mask walking in the door and then you sit down at the table and as soon as you're eating and drinking, you're not wearing a mask. So, you know, I, I have been in restaurants um, I tend not to go into places that are what I think are really crowded. Um, but I do think, you know, restaurants are always the place we worried about um, because of the fact you have your mask off so much of the time in a restaurant. But if I go into a retail shop, if it's, you know, not a lot of people in there, um, that's one thing. But if I'm going to go into Home Depot or I'm going to go into a grocery store, I'm much more likely to put a mask on in that setting. And I would say that, and in addition to what said, you know, one of the activities that I probably am more cautious about now than I was several weeks ago is working out in indoor gym facilities, um, particularly given that, you know, there are no capacity limits and restrictions. Um, and depending upon the time of day, you know, if I go, there's sometimes I go where it's fairly empty, I can space out and not be, you know, on top of somebody else or in close proximity for an extended period of time. And there are others where it's a lot more crowded, where I'm more likely to, uh, you know, have my mask on, um, you know, due to ventilation, due to capacity, those kinds of things. Right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kevin. We're about seven minutes before we need to um, follow this hard stop. And we have a couple of reporters questions. Stephanie Lai, The Washington Post, I believe, your question, the, po the one you posted on the chat has been answered. Do you need a follow up on that? Um, I was actually wondering, um, do we have any indication of how bad the virus or case numbers have to get before any of these restrictions might be reimposed? I, I, quite honestly, I feel like we've answered that question three or four times. Um, you know, we've laid out what the restrictions are, or what, not the restrictions, but the, the metrics we're looking at. Um, I think as a proxy, the CDC has, you know, using the different categories for moderate and substantial transmission, um, they've, very, they've laid that out on their website in terms of what those numbers are. And as we've discussed, you know, we would use those numbers as proxies. We wouldn't necessarily wait until they got to that point to take action, particularly if the trends are indicating that those levels would be imminent. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, the last question, Jess Arnold, WUSA 9. Jess? Hey, yeah, just a quick uh, follow-up on the breakthroughs. And sorry if you already got to this, I came on a little late. Um, of the breakthrough cases that you mentioned, Dr. Gales, about how many of those uh, were hospitalized or you know passed away? And do you have any indication if it was the Delta variant that they had contracted or another variant? Sure, thank you, Jess, for your question. So uh, based upon 
the analysis that I have available, because uh, it has been a little tricky trying to coordinate CRISP data, Immunet data, and those kinds of things, as best as I can tell and what the team has shared with me is that none of those breakthrough cases have resulted in hospitalizations. So in the last month, for example, we've seen, I'm looking at my numbers, in the last four weeks, we've had approximately 608 new COVID cases. Uh, we speculate that the majority of those are Delta variant cases because as you may recall, not every positive test gets sequenced to know what type of strain it is. Um, but we do speculate the majority, um, if it's consistent with the state, we're, we're seeing approximately probably 50 to 55% of new cases being the Delta variant. Um, so out of that 608 new cases, 32 of those cases were hospitalized. Uh, and as best as we can tell, none of those individuals were fully vaccinated. Um, and of that 608, 144 of those were uh, fully vaccinated or had received at least one dose. Now, there may be uh, a few that, that may have actually ended up hospitalized, but as best as I can tell, based upon the analysis that I have available to me at this time, none of those breakthrough cases resulted in hospitalizations and none of them resulted in COVID fatalities. Thank you. All right, that was the last question from reporters on the chat. Thank you everybody for joining us. That'll be all for today and uh, we'll see you again soon. Have a great afternoon and stay safe. Thank you all very much.